Hi, I'm Glenn Huey. Welcome to PopularWoodworking.com videos. The cover project on our June 2008 issue of Popular Woodworking magazine is a slipper-footed tea table. Now, I built the slipper-footed tea table with a bit of a twist uh, to eliminate concerns for cross-grain movement as the top expands and contracts. I've actually built a floating top into the table. Now, how that works is the top is rabbited on all four edges and sets down onto the base frame or the frame of the table. Then there's a two-step molding that wraps around that top and is also attached to the base frame or to the aprons of the table. The second part of that two-stage molding is a small cove that comes out on top of the tabletop and that traps that top into position. Now that little cove molding is the subject of today's video. Now one suggestion that I want to make as we get started and get prepped on our material is you should prep a couple extra pieces of material to make your cove moldings. Once you've changed the setup here at the table saw, it's almost impossible to come back and make matching identical molding if you should run short. So I make it a practice to do at least one extra part. Also, you want to do two small pieces, at least six inches of length, that match the same wood because we're going to use those two small pieces to set up the table saw blade and our auxiliary fence that we're going to use here to make the cove moldings. So here you can get a look at the two pieces that we've made for uh, setting up the table saw blade. I'm going to take the two pieces and I'm going to cut a radius based on the setup that we do that cuts across from end to end and also arcs up to a certain spot in the center. So for my three quarter inch molding, I'm going to leave a quarter inch here at the top. So I want to pull down and mark a quarter inch area from the back face of the molding. And then also come in a quarter inch from both edges and put our two marks. Now I've made two pieces here because I've marked one end on one and one end on the other because we will set them in this orientation in order to set up our blade and get everything started. Now the first step we have to take is setting up our table saw blade is to set the height of cut. It's the most important part because everything else is going to figure based off of that height. Once we do that we can turn and start doing the rest of the setup. Everything else comes off of that height. If we would make the other set up first, then come in and change the height, we're actually changing the overall cut. So we want to make sure that we bring that blade right down to where it just lines with the line that we made on the molding, on a piece. So you can see here, I've got this tooth that I'm looking at, and I'm going to rotate the blade a little bit and just make sure that we're right at that line, because that's where we're going to come up to and that's where we want our final setting to be when we're finished with the cove molding. Now the next setup here at the table saw is where things get a little bit different. Um, we're going to use a straight edge and clamp it down at an angle to our blade. And then we're going to pass our stock over the blade forming that cove cut. Now, what you'll see is a, a lot of people like to put their auxiliary fence below the table saw blade with the idea that as you run the stock, the rotation of the blade spins the stock and pushes it back against the fence. Now, that's certainly a fine way to do it. However, I feel a bit awkward having to reach over my fence and drag the piece back down towards my fence. What I do is position my fence on the outfeed side of the blade. Now, this requires me to do a couple different things. By having it here, if I lose contact with that piece, it will, the blade will pull it away from my fence and ruin my setup or ruin my piece of stock. But it requires me to have constant contact on the piece as it goes over the blade, which is something you should do at the table saw at all times. What's interesting here is once I get this positioned and clamped down, I will take a second fence, a little magnetic fence, and set it in there to help hold things tight to the fence. So let's talk about how we're going to get this locked in. And this is where these two pieces come into play. I'm going to set one of them on the infeed side and one of the pieces on the outfeed side. Now here you can see the setup. We're looking at the front block. So this is the infeed side of the blade and I'm bringing my block up to it. And here you can see just as my uh, saw blade comes off of the piece, just below the surface of the table, you can see where I'm coming just right up to that line. That's exactly what we're looking for. Now here's a look at the outfeed side piece and you can see if we look at this tooth of the blade right here as I spin that backwards and it just tips below the table it's right at our layout line. 
That's the position for our fence, and I've locked it down, and we're ready to take the next step. Now we've got everything locked in place. We've got our auxiliary fence set, and we're ready to go. I've taken my main piece of stock and brought it in tight to the fence and right in front of the blade, and I'm going to use this magnetic fence in order to give me some extra support holding my piece tight against my fence. That way I'm not worried about having it move away from the blade as the blade's cutting. Uh, the other thing we're going to do is use safety glasses for sure and a push stick or push tool. Now this is something you want to have because as we push this over the blade, we don't want to let our hand travel over the top of the blade. The blade is cutting below the stock. We know with full extension we're going to be still a quarter inch below the back surface of our piece, but we still want to make it a practice not to put our hands over the blade as it's running. So as I start this through and begin pushing, once I get enough of the stock past the blade, I will position my hand here to help hold the piece tight as we come off of the fence. Now from here, there's no way that you could make this cut in a single pass. So what we need to do is lower the blade down to where it just comes about a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch above the table and then we'll make a pass each time raising the blade until we reach the full extent which is to cut right at the uh, layout line that we did a quarter inch from this back surface. So let's take a look and see how it works. Now at this point I'm going to slightly raise the blade again between a sixteenth and an eighth and take a nice slow pass. What happens then is we increase that cut each time. What I suggest is on your last pass, the one that you're finished up and hit all your lines, that you take it very, very slow. The reason for that is it will clean the cut a little bit more and you won't have as much sanding to do. Now one thing is yep. for sure, if you raise the blade too high, you will notice it as you start to cut because it really requires force. We're not looking to force the piece over the blade, we're looking to push the piece over the blade. So if you start the cut and it feels like it's requiring too much force to move the piece of stock, stop, lower the blade a little bit and start your cut. Now as you can see, we have a few more cuts to make before we reach our two edge lines and our face line right here. So we'll raise the blade again and continue the cutting process until we hit those three points. Here's my finished piece of stock. You can see that I hit my line in all three places. Now I have my entire cove set up into the center. Now if I want to finish this piece for our tea table, I'm going to go back to the router table, round off the bottom two corners, and then simply rip the piece right down the middle. And you can make things that uh, are not going to be standard profiles that you'll find out at the stores. As I